Hello. Hello. Ethan, how are you? I'm doing good. How about you? Good. Are you a workshop participant? Yeah, I'm uh, actually working on a postcard right now. So awesome. Awesome. Cool. All right. I wasn't sure if there would be a waiting room so I can see folks are joining now. All right, so. Are you coming up for it? All right, so hi everybody. Um, I can see that folks are slowly filtering in. Um, I am so delighted that you've decided to spend your Thursday evening with me. Um, so we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. As you get settled, if you could go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat with your name and where you're zooming on, in from. Um, and it would also be great if you could update your name as it appears in Zoom to include your pronouns. And I'll do the same for myself right now. For those that don't know, do you wanna uh, explain how to do that? That was an issue I know in some of my classes. Oh, sure. Yeah, so if you um, hover your mouse down to the bottom where you have the menu that says, uh, well, you'll probably have some different options than me, um, but you should be able to see an icon labeled participants. If you click on the participants icon, um, it should bring up a little menu and find your name. And next to your name, there should be a button that says more um, that gives you the option to rename. So, let me know if you have any trouble doing that.
Rhonda, is there anything that you would like to um, say before we get started about the Story Map project? Yeah. Um, do you mind if I share my screen and just show the oh, website? Of course. Yeah. So uh, let's see. Share my screen. One. Um, so uh, I work with, uh, I'm working with Diane on uh, a project, um, and this is one of the workshops that is kind of a part of a larger project, the San Jose Story Map, um, which is going to be a graphical kind of um, using a map interface to tell stories that uh, are underrepresented when we kind of think about San Jose as a community. Uh, a subset of that uh, project is the Wish You Were Here. <laughs> project, which is specifically looking at using uh, postcards as a mechanism to tell stories and to kind of share work um, during COVID. So um, we're going to be working with the Thompson Gallery on an exhibition uh, using correspondence as a kind of a medium. And as part of that exhibition, there will be um, a design contest. So the gallery will be printing um, 15, no, I'm, we're, the, the total number just changed. So there'll be four uh, designs chosen that are these unique limited edition artworks. So those will be postcards that are designed as an artwork front and back. So like if you are a writer and you wanna use the text portion on the back as a part of the kind of conceptual conceit of the artwork and the front of the design, that would be uh, what would, this is the contest that you would wanna to apply to. And then the 10 designs will be uh, chosen uh, for distribution to the community as a way uh, that the gallery can distribute these postcards and then receive comments back from the community about their experiences of living and kind of being in San Jose. Um, you can also, of course, ap apply for both contests. So as a part of these workshop, as a part of this con, uh, con <laughs> test, I'm sorry, I'm actually sick today. <laughs> My brain is like boiling, <laughs> words are coming slowly today. Um, as a part of this contest, uh, we're running these workshops uh, for students who might not have skills in like design Photoshop. I ran a 3D scanning workshop last night and we had a, an ARC GIS, a story map uh, workshop ran uh, last week. We'll have a writing workshop tomorrow and then a couple other great workshops. There'll be the mapping Zoom space that I think Diane can probably tell you about too on the 19th. So if you're interested in attending any of these workshops, uh, you can um, hopefully when you registered, you got a, a bunch of emails with a bunch of links. They're all there. So you can kind of peruse through all the workshops and, and see what might be interest, uh, interesting to you and attend some more of those workshops. So that's all on the website here, um, which is linked in all of the emails that you've received. <laughs> Thank you for that platform, Diane. Yeah, of course. Um, thanks for um, contextualizing this within the larger project. Um, okay, so it looks like um, we have a pretty good group gathered here. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, let's see, I'll share my screen again. If I can find my way back. And depending on your preference, um, as I'm sharing my screen, you can um, choose to just follow along as I go through each slide, um, but you're also welcome to um, follow along on your own. So let me just, last thing before we get started is I'm gonna share a link with you in the chat. <laughs> Okay, so here we go. Okay, so let me just do a quick check. Um, can you see my slides? Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. And can you hear me okay? Or would you like me to speak any louder? It's good here. Okay, awesome. Thank you for that feedback. All right, so let's see. Okay, here we go. So um, 
You have all arrived here, um, hopefully because you're also interested in taking a closer look at the typography that surrounds us. Um, briefly, before we get into it, I'll go over our agenda for our quick workshop. I think it's going to fly by. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of an introduction about who I am and why I'm interested in um, vernacular typography. And then I'm going to take you on a typographic tour of my neighborhood in West San Jose called Burbank. Um, we'll use some um, signs from this area to talk about basic sign types. And I'll also introduce some basic typography terms that I think might be helpful as you're looking at typography, vernacular typography in your own um, neighborhoods, wherever it is you are right now. Um, and then lastly, I'll go over a few different prompts for creating hyper-local postcards inspired by the typography you see in your neighborhood. And um, there are four prompts ranging in kind of level of um, uh, specificity towards ambiguity for um, hopefully to meet you where you are. And then I'll have some time for a Q&A at the very end. Um, so because we're starting, a, um, we're talking about place and placemaking and um, where we are located, um, I wanna take just a moment to pause and acknowledge that San Jose State University and um, where I reside sits on the land of the Ohlone and Muwekma Ohlone people. I would like to acknowledge their continued connection and contributions to our community and region and give thanks to them for allowing us to live, work, learn, and pray on their ancestral homeland. I offer my respect to their elders and to all Ohlone people of the past and present. And um, given that we're talking about typography and language, I think it's also important to recognize that the cultural heritage of California begins um, no less than 15,000 years ago and that the entire Bay Area rests on evidence of indigenous cultures. Um, so I would invite you to, um, you know, check out these links to learn more about the original caretakers of this area. And um, you can use the native lands uh, link that's also provided here to learn more about the land where you reside. Okay, okay. so um, as a means of introduction, my name is Diane Lee and I'm an assistant professor at San Jose State University. Um, I don't think I've met most of the folks in the room um, today. So um, I wanted to mention that I teach in the graphic design program. And some of the classes that I teach are introduction to typography, visual communication and process, and introduction to graphic design. Um, and so this course, uh, this workshop is probably most related to the class um, introduction to typography that I teach in the fall semester. So if you enjoy this class, you may be interested in registering for that in a future semester. Um, my background and how I became interested in typography um, is through my work as a branding consultant. And my work involves designing printed publications, magazines, books, and catalogs, designing websites, as well as designing for exhibitions and retail spaces. Um, I've only, in my career so far, I've only designed proposals for signage um, in the public realm. And so it is a dream of mine to have, to design a sign for the street. Um, so um, fingers crossed that that might happen sometime down the road. And then um, just a little bit more about my work history is um, I've worked both um, as a part of in-house design teams and at design agencies. Um, I began my career on the Apple retail design team, not far from where I am now, uh, just down the road in Cupertino. And um, I've, my, uh, the bulk of my work experience was um, working at an agency 
uh, called Vanderbilt Design um, before I kind of um, moved into academia. So I, I have worked and continue to work as a freelance designer since 2014. Um, so some of the reasons, I'm gonna go a little bit back into history now to talk about why I think I'm interested in vernacular typography. Um, I was born in the Pacific Northwest in Canada in a very, very small town of about 9,000 people, a town called Kitimat. And in that town, there wasn't a lot to look at aside from trees and mountains and like the incredible landscape that surrounded us. But, um, you know, I found myself really interested in um, signs when they did show up because it was such an interruption to um, the landscape. Um, so you might drive for 100 kilometers before ever seeing another sign for, um, for another town. Um, and most of the signs in that area are kind of imp improvised from materials that are easily found. And so a lot of people happen to have like a pile of wood <laughs> nearby and a lot of signs were made out of um, scrap material and used a router to carve the letter forms into the signs. Um, when I was still very young, I was in the third grade, my family moved from this town in Northern British Columbia to the other side of the country to Montreal in Quebec. And um, in the year that we moved to Quebec, there was a uh, a separatist referendum happening. It was a huge political moment and there were signs absolutely everywhere. And I think this made such an impression on me because suddenly I went from an environment that had very little in the way of signage to one where the environment was completely oversaturated with signage. And for someone who was just learning French at the time, um, it was really easy for me to connect to um, what these signs were saying because the two sides of this um, separatist referendum were just referred to as uh, oui ou non, meaning yes or no. And Montreal is a really interesting place to look at signage because it's a bilingual city. And so um, in Quebec, um, and it's a little bit different than in other parts of Canada, but in Quebec, there are very specific language laws that determine um, how the two official languages appear and in what relation to one another. And this is a cause for you know, quite a lot of um, uh, focus and emphasis in a lot of political discussions. And so, um, to me, what was really interesting about this experience of moving to a place where I was still just learning the language was I got to understand pretty easily um, what was being said because um, I could read English, I wasn't able to read French. And so the decisions about how the typography appeared, how the two languages were treated, um, I became really aware of that uh, during my time living there. And it also struck me as pretty interesting because even some of the global brands that um, you know, many of us will be familiar with, like um, you know, this image of uh, a Kentucky fried chicken bucket would be translated into French um, to abide by the language laws there. And so um, for me, it was always about you know, taking a close look at the signage to better understand um, the place where I then resided. Um, and, you know, as a second, third, fourth, fifth grader, I didn't really understand the complexities and the politics and um, the meaning behind some of these um, decisions, but it was a pretty interesting um, way in and a way to get curious about type and design and type and design in the public realm. So before we go too much further, I wanted to um, 
talk about a few definitions that might be helpful for our conversation. Um, so first of all, vernacular is usually used to um, refer to a language or dialect that's spoken by ordinary people in a particular country or region. So for example, um, you know, the manner in which um, people in Quebec speak French is a vernacular that's different from the manner in which people in France speak French. Um, when vernacular is used to talk about architecture, um, it's concerned with kind of domestic and functional buildings rather than buildings that are um, kind of monumental and very important in their scale and significance culturally. So um, moving on to the word typography, um, there are many dif different definitions of typography, but the one that I like best is um, that typography is primarily concerned with designing with prefabricated letter forms. And I think that definition is really helpful because it distinguishes um, the practice of typography from the practice of um, type design or lettering design, which are both strongly related, but um, ever so slightly different. And so when those terms are combined, um, you could say that vernacular typography um, are the letter forms selected, created, and applied by people whose primary occupation does not involve regular work with letter forms. I find this definition to be very helpful, but it's a little bit narrow. And so I just wanted to say that um, for the purpose of this presentation, I'm thinking a little bit more broadly about um, vernacular typography. Sometimes I include um, examples uh, from practitioners who are interested and whose primary occupation involves letter forms like sign painters or sign makers. Um, but I think that um, I'm really interested in the everyday and the ordinary and things that are functional as opposed to um, something that might be kind of referred to as capital D design or just kind of fancy. Um, so I hope this helps kind of guide our conversation a little bit more. So next I want you to come with me on kind of a virtual walk around Burbank. Um, so I think it's important to acknowledge that I am a newcomer to Burbank. I moved to San Jose in 2018, and I've lived in this neighborhood ever since. Um, and it's a really um, interesting community because it's an unincorporated part of San Jose, um, but it is completely surrounded by San Jose. So I started getting interested in the neighborhood when I had to start figuring out why our um, garbage collection was different than the city of San Jose and things like that. Um, but particularly in the time of COVID when um, I'm traveling less and I'm spending much more time in and around my um, home, I became a lot more interested in looking closely at the signs that are all throughout the neighborhood. Um, I think it says a lot about this place that I, you know, I'm still trying to figure out what exactly that is, but it's um, these signs have been a guide into learning more about the history of this place. So probably my favorite of the signs and the one that really got me um, interested in Burbank um, because um, it actually refers to Burbank in the sign is a sign for the Burbank Cinema. And the Burbank Cinema has an uh, interesting history. Um, it first opened in 1949 and it operated as an art house theater until the late 1960s. In um, 19, oh, late 1960s, so between 19, you know, 68, 69, until 1973, it became a revival house. And then from 1973 until 2000, it became a, a cinema that showed pornographic films. 
And so um, in 2000, it was closed um, due to uh, its designation by Santa Clara County as a public nuisance. And then as I was walking around the neighborhood um, earlier in COVID, I noticed that a couple of signs had gone up in the spring that marked the building as condemned. Um, and so I really felt like, um, you know, this uh, designation of the building as condemned meant that its days are numbered and that my hope that I had ever since I moved to the neighborhood of it being revived as its, um, you know, former um, self as an art house theater um, would probably not come to fruition. Um, so I'm really intrigued by, you know, how the sign survives even in great disrepair. You can see that um, there's uh, neon that was uh, neon outlines that went on top of these dimensional letter forms. Um, and that at one point it was painted a marigold yellow. Um, and I just, I think it's really um, quite a beautiful sign. Um, the letters that stack to um, spell Burbank um, are thick and have a pretty even stroke. And then it's coupled with this really beautiful um, script type. So not too far down the road, actually just um, a catty corner from the Burbank Theater on the same side of the street is this um, abandoned, um, no longer being used strip mall. And I've walked by it a number of times and each time I keep thinking about like, oh, how long ago was this part of San Jose just bustling with these small independent businesses? Um, there's a sign for a pastry shop, the Ritz cleaners, there was a record store there and a florist. And of course I, um, you know, I kind of want those things to still exist. And um, it wasn't until putting these slides together that I realized these businesses um, for the most part, we're in operation until 2013. Um, so tracking back in Google Street View, which allows you to look at the building um, uh, over time, at least as Google has documented it, um, allowed me a little bit more insight into um, the history of this neighborhood. I say history, but 2013 wasn't all that long ago. Um, yeah. So there are some pretty precious details in these signs, like the, um, you know, what once might have been flowers coming out of a flower pot, this goofy smiley face that um, sits at the top of this Ritz Cleaners sign. Um, and it's pretty interesting to me that um, these signs survive easy, even as the building falls into disrepair. And they may not light up, um, but gosh, that like red and white plastic is still as bright as ever. And you can see that the neon lights are still intact. Um, oh, it looks like my animation didn't work so well on this one, but um, this may be uh, one of the most recognizable signs of this area. Um, it was erected in 1962, although Western Appliance had had a location in the area since about the 1930s. And um, this was kind of marked as um, uh, a locational sign at one of the big thoroughfares of the time. And it's, it's still a big thoroughfare. It's not too far from the intersection of um, 280 and 880. Um, and so many of you have probably seen this before. Um, in reading a little bit more about the history of this sign, I was kind of delighted to learn that um, to erect a sign this size, um, the, um, the folks who ran this business um, found a little bit of a loophole in the legislation around sign types in, um, in the county. And so um, you weren't at the time allowed to put a sign on top of a business. And so um, to get around that, 
Western appliance allowed the posts that hold up this sign to pierce right through the building and go into the appliance showroom down below. And I thought that was pretty fascinating. Um, one other detail that I really enjoyed learning about this sign um, is that uh, it used to have three brightly lit globes atop the three um, spires, um, but apparently um, pilots uh, flying into the San Jose airport were complaining about um, mistaking it for a signal. Um, so those um, lights at the top of the spire uh, were removed. So this gl glows very brightly in orange at night. And sadly, early in COVID, um, Western Appliance um, went out of business and the building sits, sits empty. And it's not super clear um, how long this sign will survive, um, depending on what happens with that building. Um, I thought it was also worth mentioning another sign that's maybe uh, less loved, but I think it's pretty charming. Um, so on the front of the building uh, on Western Appliance, they have this, um, you know, more recent addition um, that puts, you know, a nice cowboy hat on top of the W, one of my favorite um, signs in the neighborhood. So we're rounding the corner now. I'm, um, if you're familiar with the area or if you were to track these on the map, and just a quick note to say that if you want to explore a little bit more, um, these links at the bottom of the slide will take you um, to a Google Street Maps, Google Street View um, uh, location where you can kind of look at the sign and see it in the context of the street. Um, so this is another one of my favorites. Um, I think you'll probably start to get the sense that um, my neighborhood has a little bit of a checkered history. Um, Why Not is an adult toy store now, um, but it used to be a bar. Um, and this part below that now says adult toys store, arcade um, hyphen DVDs. Um, that used to be a marquee sign um, where they could kind of update with um, upcoming acts, performers, or specials, um, events that would happen at the bar. And um, the sign is pretty interesting to me um, because the uh, letter Y is meant to represent a martini glass. And um, it may be a little bit hard to tell from this image, but the question mark in the center of the glass, the little dot at the base of it is in fact an olive um, to kind of be suggestive of the bar and the martini. So I like to imagine the kind of bar that it might've been um, years ago before it um, turned into this adult toy store. Um, I think this is probably the last example from Burbank and so, uh, I don't think I completed this sentence, but we've come up along Bascom to West San Carlos and we've um, made a turn on West San Carlos heading towards downtown San Jose now. And so this is another really beautiful um, sign example. Um, and there's a few different things going on um, at this bar called the Bears. Um, it has a very beautiful hand-painted sign that takes up the whole side of the building um, as it goes down, I think, Raymond Street. And then it also has this really beautiful um, neon sign component. So during the day or at night, it's open all the time, this bar. Um, uh, you can always kind of find your way there. It's pretty well marked. Um, and so, I think, you know, another thing that I wanted to kind of mention, um, especially with this example, is that um, sign painting is a, a very, um, used to be a much more common trade and fewer and fewer sign painters are around. Um, so uh, again, in researching a little bit more information about each of these signs for the sake of talking about them with you, um, I did a little bit, a bit of digging to find out who was the artist who painted the sign. And so um, 
this artist um, sadly passed away a couple of years ago. His name is Anthony Lima. And um, what I learned in uh, reading a little bit about him, what little I could find, um, was that uh, he was also um, on staff with the San Francisco Giants for much of his career. And so, um, you know, this is information gleaned um, from the obituary of a sign painter called uh, Anthony Lima. And I kind of tried to triangulate that research a little bit, um, but I found it interesting to think um, about how there's a stamp of the San Francisco Giants on this neighborhood dive bar um, right here in Burbank. And so you can see that there's kind of different eras of um, sign painting here also. Um, this person was obviously very skilled and very oriented towards detail. And one of the things that I love that shows up in this image here is the great care that the artist took in um, making sure that, um, you know, this electrical um, wiring and the tube that it's all housed in didn't interfere with um, the legibility of the sign. All right, this is a slide that I've put for myself um, as a reminder to take a water break. So um, as I'm kind of catching my breath, I'm wondering, are there any signs in and around San Jose or your hometown um, where you're calling in from? I think there's folks here from Palm Springs and Oakland and Fresno. Um, so I'm just curious if um, there are any in your neck of the woods that um, you've admired. It's kind of an obvious choice uh, for Oakland, but um, when I moved here in 2000, most of downtown was boarded up and kind of shut down. And there was a gorgeous uh, theater downtown, the Fox Theater, which was also kind of boarded up and, and non-operational. And um, I think it was like part of Jerry Brown's kind of development package. He actually lived in the lofts above it for a long time when he was the uh, oh, wow. mayor of Oakland, but he, uh, he worked out a deal with contractors um, to revamp it and then open it again, I think in like 2004 or something, um, 2005, maybe later, I don't remember. But now it's just, you know, like uh, beautiful. They redid the Art Deco interior, but on the outside is this just absolutely fabulous uh, marquee that they refurbished. And oh, yeah. it was one of the first kind of read like sites of redevelopment in Oakland during a time when it was really depressed and it didn't, it brought in a lot of activity in a really um, kind of like positive way because the development strategy was uh, sensitive to issues around gentrification. It also wasn't, you know, that much of an issue because there was still cheap, super cheap and uh, available housing all around. Mm. Um, so it was kind of this marker of this really exciting time in, in Oakland. And I just, you know, looking at some of your, your sign, this is again, an exaggerated version, but it just kind of brought back all of these feelings of like hope and promise and that, that, that these gorgeous buildings in downtown Oakland that have been long forgotten could, could possibly be an Uber <laughs> quarters, I don't know, like now that, that that's what's happening, but there was so much promise in it at the time. And oh, um, yeah. so the neon work was just like stunning and, and gorgeous. And the, the nearby there was a, 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 the Paramount Theater, which was still in operation, um, um, continued operation when I moved uh, and is still there, but doesn't book the big acts now that the Fox can, because it can hold a much larger group of people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love the Fox Theater is such a beautiful example of, um, you know, uh, saving something that could have easily, you know, fallen beyond disrepair. Um, yeah. And I, I was thinking about the Paramount um, also, and just like how lively it feels to be down there when the signs are lit up. Um, 
Yeah. One of awesome. my favorite shows of all time. I think it was 2001. It was before the Fox opened, but uh, I saw Prince in the, the Paramount Theater in Oakland. And it was like such a wonderful and mixed audience. And it was, you know, all of the things that I love about Oakland, it was kind of encapsulated in that, that moment. Oh, anyway. I love that. Oh, thank you for sharing that, Rhonda. Yeah, thank um, you for making making space for that opportunity. Yeah, um, I'm also enjoying the comments in the chat. Um, there's an arcade in Ethan's hometown called Oh Wow that uses nickels as the letter O. <laughs> Sounds beautiful. I would love to see a photograph of that. And then James adds that the Shanghai neon in Japantown is wonderful and lights up Jackson Street and Stephen, oh yeah, Stephen's meets on Montgomery, just south south of the Shark Tank. Yeah, those are two um, beautiful examples um, that I really, really love. Um, yeah, awesome, cool. Thanks for sharing, everyone. Um, there's a couple of really good signs also just in the span of space between Burbank and San Jose State University. And one of the things that I miss the most of um, from you know, being uh, teaching remotely and not riding the bus anymore is um, not getting to admire the diamond laundry sign. And um, there's like a, a figure of a person. I can't remember what the sign's for, um, but um, they're all along my bus route um, between here and downtown San Jose. All right, so next I wanted to walk through a few basic sign types. Um, and I may need to go through this at a bit of a clip, um, but I think it's just helpful to have um, categories for thinking about the signs. Um, although I think you'll find in looking at the signs in your neighborhoods and all around you, um, oftentimes these categories kind of blend and overlap and um, there are some examples that are perhaps a little bit more constrained depending on when they were created. Um, and as technology um, improves, um, some of the constraints of certain sign types um, uh, um, maybe become less restrictive. Um, so first and foremost, um, neon signs. Um, they're signs that use um, a cold, cathode gas discharge tube um, produced in straight or formed configurations. Um, the gas that's used um, also will contribute to what color it emits as light. And so um, these signs are almost always referred to as neon signs, but um, more often than not, um, the gas that is um, uh, being discharged in these tubes um, are a mixture of two or more other inert gases, including argon, helium, krypton, or xenon. Um, and uh, the next sign type that I wanted to mention is a changeable copy sign. And I really like these signs because um, I find that uh, the folks who maintain and have to update signs with changeable copy tend to get really creative if they're missing a letter. And so that's one of my favorite things to look for when I'm looking at signs is, um, you know, is the M an M or is it an upside down W and vice versa? Um, is the eight right side up? The eight can also often be used as a B in case you run out of Bs. Um, and so a changeable copy sign is any, um, where the copy or the symbols can change automatically or manually. Um, and so this is kind of the bottom portion of the Burbank cinema um, where uh, up until a few years ago, I think it still said like outstanding pornographic films or something like that. I've seen a few really funny images um, of the things that were on this marquee um, while uh, this building was still somewhat inhabited. Um, all right, and so then we go to dimensional letter signs. And so these are um, 
cut out, cast, fabricated, or molded materials in the shape of a letter, logo, or symbol. Um, so in this example, um, I thought it uh, was interesting to see how um, this Burbank cinema sign is using um, cut out metal um, as well as neon layered on top of it for an outline. Um, and then a huge category of signs is an illuminated sign, um, which is just any sign with electrical equipment installed for illumination at night or in early morning darkness. And um, signs can either be um, internally illuminated um, by a light source that's contained within, or sometimes you'll also see signs that are uh, lit externally. And so, um, you know, there might be a separate light that's aimed at the surface of the sign. And so this example of the florist shop that once was on Bascom, I think is kind of nice because um, as it's broken, you can see in to the fluorescent, fluorescent tubing. And so, um, you know, it, there was this plastic you can imagine was somewhat translucent to allow the light to emanate from within. Um, and then I'm also imagining that, um, you know, at some point these, um, uh, each of these, I think flowers uh, would have had a shade on top of it to kind of um, uh, mask the light bulb there. And they look like compact fluorescent light bulbs. So that um, kind of holds if this was uh, a florist shop still in business in 2013. Um, and of course the hand painted sign. And so this is a sign that's painted directly on a building surface or on glass. Um, if the sign is a third party or outdoor advertising display, it could be several stories high and designed for high impact visibility. And so you certainly see this in urban centers um, like the ghost signs in New York, where you can see uh, you know, a large um, exposed brick facade that has evidence of um, the sign that was there. And sometimes these large hand-painted signs become visible when a, um, when a building has been knocked down um, or when renovations happen. So most common is uh, the vinyl sign. And so vinyl signs are used very commonly because they're cheap and they're highly customizable. Um, so vinyl is a material that's backed with adhesive and they can be applied on a sign sub substrate or they can be applied directly to a wall or window. And vinyl can be printed on, it can be cut in many different shapes, it can be layered, it can be laminated or even wrapped on vehicles. So I think that um, vinyl signs, because of their um, low cost and their like uh, kind of the limit, the low number of constraints that you have when you're working with vinyl, make it a very attractive sign type for business owners. Um, but one of the things that I think is maybe the most sad about vinyl signs is that um, it doesn't take long, especially in a climate like in San Jose, for these vinyl applied letters to start to um, deteriorate. And so, you know, these businesses are probably a lot younger. <laughs> They're still in operation um, today um, than something like the Burbank Cinema. Um, and yet the signs are already starting to um, deteriorate. Um, I also really like what happens when um, these signs start to deteriorate, deteriorate. So I think it's, there's a beauty to it as well. Um, but uh, it also makes me think that, oh gosh, if this were painted, it would have um, lasted quite a bit longer. All right, and so um, next is the ready-made sign, which I also really love. Um, and I kind of defined ready-made signs as, you know, a sign that was purchased as, at an office supply store, or business supply store, that is either a template or a generic sign that can be used by many businesses without need for customization. 
And so these are a few different businesses uh, just in and around my neighborhood. I like the layering of various open signs uh, in the example here on the left. Um, there's also kind of um, uh, pre-made uh, number stickers that you could buy at a hardware store to um, use to display your address. Um, the business hour signs that only requires a limited amount of customization for businesses to use. Um, and I just really love um, the interesting typographic choices that show up here and um, the choices that kind of disappear because we are so used to seeing them. Um, so I'm sure many of you have seen these uh, or examples of um, open signs quite like this, these ones. Um, but gosh, isn't it interesting to kind of step by step go through, okay, this person chose a slab serif typeface um, that's condensed and they made it orange and they made an outline and then it's got a heavy drop shadow on it. Um, and I, I just think it's so interesting that that then becomes um, the default for businesses to use. Um, and then lastly, um, I really enjoy observing the improvised signs that um, pop up from time to time in the neighborhood. Um, so signs that are made improvisationally, easy to source tools were used to make these signs like paint and scrap wood, poster board and Sharpie, or eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper. Um, so at least in my neighborhood, like every Sunday, which is the night before garbage day, um, usually, a nice handful of examples of free signs go up. Um, and depending on, you know, the effort put in by um, the person who made them, sometimes they could be, um, you know, just a little bit inconsistent in their lettering. And sometimes they're done with great care. Um, and I, I really enjoy seeing um, the examples that pop up. All right. So I'm curious, given these sign types, if you could make a guess about what you think the most common sign type in your neighborhood might be. I would venture to guess that either vinyl signs on glass or vinyl applied to a, like a plastic substrate would probably be um, fairly common in most areas. Oh, um, Ethan writes painted signs, especially downtown. Yeah, there, there are wonderful, beautiful painted signs downtown. Um, open, closed, ready-made sign and menus. Yeah, yeah. Um, Awesome, cool, thank you. Okay, so I'm just gonna keep going um, because I'm aware of the time slipping away. So I just wanted to talk through a few common typographic terms that would be really helpful for describing the signs that you might see in your neighborhood. So the first three terms that I would like to share with you relate to spacing. And so I think some of the most um, like nuanced typographic decisions that typographers and graphic designers make are those around spacing. And we're most concerned with interletter spacing, interword spacing, and interline spacing. Um, so the space that um, exists between letters the space that exists between words, and then the space that exists between lines of text. Um, and so I think, you know, what happens when you're working with ready-made signs and when the folks putting the signs together aren't super concerned with spacing is that, um, you know, things that graphic designers may not consider doing happen on some of these common sign types. So um, kerning is something that refers to interletter spacing that's adjusted between two individual letters. And so um, this is 
kind of highly, highly refined spacing that um, you would make to accommodate the particular shape of a letter form. So um, in the word pool here, um, this is a completely curved letter. And so the negative space between these letters tends to appear larger than between um, uh, a curved letter and a straight letter. And so because this sign I think was done with a lot of care and practice um, by a professional sign painter, I think the kerning overall is really, really good here. Um, so next we go to tracking that is interletter spacing that is applied to a whole word, a whole line or a whole paragraph of text. And um, this can be done to um, kind of make refinements to like how much space the text takes up. Um, this can be done to adjust for um, how tight or loose a given typeface might feel. And so when I look at this um, towing sign, um, I can tell you with confidence that this tracking is very, very, very tight. <laughs> and it makes me think that um, what was determined first and foremost was the outside dimensions of the sign. And then the spacing was adjusted to fit the exterior dimensions. Um, so letting is the amount of space between two lines of text and it's usually measured from baseline to baseline. And the baseline is the letter, uh, the invisible line on which all letters sit. And so you can see that the letting between these lines of text is um, fairly consistent between pool and open and open to video, but then there's a bigger gap between video and parking and a bigger gap between cocktail and pool. And I think, you know, again, this has been done with great care. And so um, there are distinctions um, that are being made to kind of um, tell a reader um, that these are different kinds of information um, and they have different significance in the overall hierarchy of information here. Um, the stroke is a basic component of a letter form, and it is basically what makes up um, all letter forms. Strokes can be straight, they can be curved, um, and if they're straight, um, they could be horizontal, vertical, or diagonal, and if they're curved, they could be open or closed. And so, um, you know, sometimes you might see a curved letter like a lowercase a that doesn't completely close. Um, and a good example sometimes happens in script typography um, when the top of the A doesn't quite meet the thicker stroke here. And then you probably know this, serif are small finishing details at the start and end of strokes and weights refer to the um, thickness of a stroke. Um, the stroke can be consistent or variable and the differences in the stroke's thickness can be subtle or very high contrast. And so I think that this vocabulary will probably give you um, the specificity that you would need to talk about um, the typography that you see. Um, so I think, you know, just to um, talk a little bit more about um, the weight, um, so there's a high contrast difference in the thin and thick parts of this script typography that's using that's being used for the word cocktail and for the word lounge. And then there's a very low contrast difference, a very subtle difference between the thickest parts and the thinnest parts of this sans serif typeface. And so sans serif just means there's no serif. Um, okay, one more water break before we go into the last part where I'll be sharing prompts um, that you can use to develop postcards. Um, so the question here is, does, do any of you have a favorite font? Helvetica forever. <laughs> 
acumen variable concept. Nice. Awesome. Well, I think that um, Helvetica is probably one of the most commonly used typefaces if you um, would include Helvetica and all of its derivatives. I don't know Adamina so well, James, um, but I'll have to look it up afterwards. Um, I'm always kind of curious to see what folks um, will say. Acumen is one that I really like to even. Um, it's a great typeface and it, um, you know, with, we're not really getting into variable type here, um, given the context of the workshop, but um, uh, definitely wor worthy of further discussion. All right, so there are four prompts that I want to offer you as um, ways in to potentially developing a postcard for this postcard project. Um, so the first one is developing a neighborhood alphabet. And I really like this prompt because it gives me a way in that feels really approachable and really easy. And so with this prompt, you will be working towards a collection of letters that make up the entirety of the alphabet. Um, one of the big annoyances to me about the Roman alphabet um, is that there are 26 characters and that doesn't lay out very easily when you're just trying to like lay out a nice um, grid of letters. And so um, for the purpose of um, the template that I'm providing related to this one, um, I'm also asking you to collect six extra characters that would include numbers or punctuation um, or ampersands. Um, and that just um, helps to complete uh, a more balanced grid. And so the steps for this prompt would be to go on a stroll to photographically document as, as many letters as you can, individual letters. Um, and I find that when I'm trying to complete an alphabet, it helps me if I keep a list um, with me so that I can check them off if I go uh, as I go. Um, because once you've collected, you know, 10 or 15 letters, you might lose track of like, do I have a cue yet? This is a pretty interesting cue. <laughs> um, so I find that when I'm looking for every letter of the alphabet, it also acquaints me and makes me very aware of how common certain letters are and how difficult it can be to find certain letters out in the wild. And so Q is one that tends to be pretty difficult to find. X is one that tends to be difficult to find. Um, and, and of course, Z or Z is another that um, is pretty difficult to find on signs. Um, so one thing that you would need to keep in mind as you're on your stroll collecting letters is that you should be composing each photo so that the letter is the unambiguous focal point of your photograph. And I'll say a little bit more about that when I show you an example. Um, so once you have your collection of um, in total 32 characters, did I get that right? 32 characters, the grid is four by eight. Um, uh, once you have that collection, you can very easily just um, drop in each letter into the provided template. So this isn't using the postcard template, but this is an example of one um, neighborhood alphabet example that a student did last year. Um, although the context of this one um, also allowed for packaging and things that you might find in the domestic landscape. So um, I think it's pretty fun to um, notice which letters are so easily recognizable for the package that they're a part of or the sign type that they're a part of. So to me, the Z from Ziploc really stands out and the X from Exit um, is really um, uh, easy to spot. And then the Q from Quaker Oats. But of course, this is um, you know, from my own frame of reference and some of these other examples might be more easily recognizable to you. 
Um, so I'll go through the other prompts um, before uh, saying a little bit more about the templates. Um, so the next prompt is to select a sign type that you notice in your neighborhood. So this could be a broad category um, if you wanna give yourself a little bit of an easier time making your collection. Um, so it could be a broad category like neon signs. Or if you wanted, you could um, narrow your category a little bit more to um, develop a more consistent collection. So um, a narrower ex uh, category example could be um, ready-made open signs or improvised free signs as we've kind of talked about already. So this also involves going on a stroll to photographically document as many examples as you can within your category. And um, I find that as soon as I start looking, um, they become so easy to spot. And sometimes if you're just looking for signs, um, they, it feels like they almost present themselves to you. Um, and so in the template that I've made for this postcard, you'll need to have at least three um, or as many as 12 to, um, depending on uh, how many you've been able to collect. So select your favorites and place them into the provided postcard template. Um, and then I'm inviting you to come up with a caption to edit the sample, um, come up with a caption and edit the sample text to reflect your ca caption. And so um, in walking around my neighborhood, I noticed a lot of toe signs and I was trying to come up with a good caption for a postcard that would feature all the toe away signs from Burbank. And I was thinking like, um, greetings from Burbank, please don't park here. Um, or greetings from Burbank, don't bring your car or something like that. So um, depending on what you find, you might be able to come up with uh, another kind of pithy um, uh, caption. I'm not sure if mine is pithy, but uh, it made me chuckle anyway. Um, all right, so the next two are a little bit more ambiguous. And so if you are comfortable with it, that ambiguity, um, uh, then I would encourage you to give these two a try. Um, so in homage to your favorite sign, um, again, I'd like you to go on a stroll in your neighborhood and notice, notice which signs you're drawn to. They don't necessarily have to be the landmark sign. Like, you know, in my neighborhood, the landmark sign is um, the Western Appliance one, but my true favorite in my neighborhood is a toss up between the why not sign and the Western appliance cowboy hat sign. Um, so then I would encourage you to take several photographs of the sign to use as your source or reference image. Um, and I like to um, work with um, a printed reference image because sometimes I'll use tracing paper um, to help me kind of um, uh, get a sense for the proportions and dimensions of the sign and of the letters. Um, and so then, oops, there's a repeat here, but um, I hope you'll forgive that. Um, I'm inviting you to draw a new version of the sign and um, you could maybe adjust the wording slightly or imagine if there's any variable um, parts of the sign, like on the why not sign, I might shift the why not sign to say something other than adult toys down below. Um, and so um, I think why not is a pretty um, fun prompt for coming up with potential captions too. So, um, all right, so I like to start with a pencil and then trace the outlines with a Sharpie. And then the last uh, step of this, um, I'm sorry for the mistake on the slide here, but the last step would be then to scan or photograph your new version and then um, drop that into the postcard template. And lastly, um, this one will require a little bit more from you, um, but I think this is still a pretty interesting example, uh, sorry, an interesting prompt. So I think that adopting the constraints of a particular sign type might be an interesting way to come up with 
new ideas for dealing with lettering and typography. So in this prompt, I invite you to pick a sign type that interests you and research how they're made. And then make a list of all of the constraints that you might encounter when working with a given sign type. Um, and so an example of this could be that neon signs are made by bending glass that contains the gases. And there have to be electrodes um, at the beginning and end of each segment. Um, and so um, the beginning and end of each segment and each segment has to be fairly um, simple. Um, you could handle like an L bend or a subtle curve, but you couldn't do um, like a whole loop, like a complete O is impossible with um, a neon sign, I think. Um, although I have never made a neon sign before, so I could be wrong about this. Um, so I like thinking about um, this as a set of potential constraints because with neon signs, your colors would be limited. It would have to be a monoline, so one single stroke weight. And then it would have to be made up of fairly simple segments. And so you can imagine um, for different sign types, like um, you know, vinyl signs that have to be cut out. Maybe the um, constraint that you would adopt from vinyl signs is that each letter form has to be cut. Um, or if you have access, cut by a CNC router or something like that. Um, so I hope that, um, you know, again, this is probably the most ambiguous and most open and would require the most from you to dive into this prompt. Um, but I hope you'll consider it anyway. Um, all right, so um, I'm noticing that we're a little bit over time, but I wanted to point to um, oh, a couple of links. Again, I'm sorry, there's a, a mistake on this, sign, uh, on this slide, but I'll update it. So um, I've made a folder of InDesign templates for each of you to use as you create postcards. And um, InDesign is a part of the Adobe Creative Suite. And so um, if you are affiliated with San Jose State, then you will have access to Creative Suite. Um, when you open an InDesign template file, it will kind of um, open up pre-populated with, um, with a grid and with text and with places where um, your images should go. And so if you um, are still with me and would like me to jump into the InDesign template, I would be more than happy to. Um, but before we do that, let me first ask if there are any questions for me and also, you know, encourage you to um, save a copy of um, the slides and um, the link to the folder, which I'll post in the chat. And um, so you can revisit these prompts and the templates um, when it's light outside and you can go for a stroll in your neighborhood. Um, so sorry, let's land on the question slide and open it up to you. Do you mind if I just uh, ask with voice? <laughs> oh, of course, of course. Um, so uh, when you, do you have a sense of how, how much kind of like direct inspiration you take from these kind of vernacular expressions in your own practice? I think that's a great question. Um, I think that um, in my practice, um, one of the things that I have been um, working with as a question is um, what rules from typography can I begin to unlearn? Mm. Um, and so there's a lot of um, uh, discussion in typography about what the right way to do something is and how, you know, like if you haven't tracked your caps a certain amount, um, then it's bad typography. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the things that I find endlessly inspiring with um, vernacular signage is that um, sometimes the folks who are making these signs 
um, have not been told what's right or wrong. And it's to their benefit because they do a lot of really interesting things. Um, and so I think to me, it's an encouragement that things can still be um, beautiful when they don't follow the rules, quote, unquote. Mm. Um, I love that. That's something I've been thinking about a lot too. And I think partly because COVID has disrupted so many normal kind of uh, professional practices in the art world um and when when you were talking about you know big is it big t typography or big d design right and so thinking also that something we talk a lot about in one of my grad seminars where we're focused on exhibition outside of gallery and museums um so getting outside of that that space um so it's been, been you know what what is that distinction between you know capital and lowercase there and what and what histories is that distinction built on and is that really something i want to carry with me through my practice absolutely so, interesting to think to hear that you're you're kind of doing the same thing and that that's a discussion in your community as well yeah absolutely um yeah i think there's one other thing that came to mind about how vernacular typography um inspires me and um i think that sometimes i feel um, like, even though we can do just about anything on the computer, I find it really, really exciting and challenging to work with other sets of tools. Um, and so I was just thinking about how, um, like, if I try to make type with a brush, or if I try to um, think about um, how like something would or would not work as a stencil or as vinyl um, or how I could make something just with the tools that I have on hand. I think that's also um, really helpful as a way of getting out of the computer and like away from the defaults that um, the software and the tools that I most commonly use in my practice um, to get away from those things and really start from um, uh, just a different a uh, set of tools, a different set of constraints and a different defaults even. Um, so I like thinking about um, like eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper as being the default instead of an artboard or instead of um, a page size that you can adjust in, um, in design. Mm. That's really interesting. Um, I'm just noticing a question in the chat from Ethan. Um, can we develop our story map postcards from a different perspective? Just notice that the cards demand personal experiences, but my experience with quarantine has been kind of boring. Um, I, I'll try to answer that and then I'll open it up to Rhonda, if you, if you wouldn't mind, Rhonda. Um, I think that your um, submission could um, absolutely um, come from a different perspective. And so I think, you know, what these workshops are intended to offer, I think, are a way in um, if you're feeling stuck. Um, yeah, and we, these workshops, you know, they kind of dislodge because they're intended to be interdisciplinary and introductory for folks who are not practice or their attempts to kind of just reframe um, a lot of these processes with like a new perspective. So I would uh, so it's very open ended, right? What we're really trying to do, my kind of personal, my kind of personal mission with this is to actually use place instead of algorithm to uh, share uh, media expression, right? So like, what if Facebook or Instagram felt like sorted my feed based on like whoever is closest to me. And so that's kind of, you know, that's kind of the, the goal here. So the, the, the Instagram post as like a bar seems like, you know, that's the kind of you know, level I'm, it doesn't have to be grandiose and common experiences, small experiences, the kind of mundane everyday experiences that we're, we're all kind of sharing in isolation, but in isolation, I think are, are are rich places. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, I don't think you need to worry um, uh, about, you know, you don't have to also, you can speak to your experience outside of quarantine as well. Yes. Yeah. But I hope that was helpful. Yeah. Thank you, Rhonda. I, I think 
you know, one more thing I just maybe wanted to add was that I, I really um, identify and um, agree with your comment. My quarantine hasn't been particularly interesting. So, um, you know, these are just from the walks that I do usually with my dog, usually within just a few blocks of my own home. Um, so I think one of the exciting things about, you know, like looking at typography is that it is everywhere. Um, and um, I think it, for me, it's an endless source of um, inspiration um, because there's so much creativity in typography and how folks use letters, design letters, lay things out with letters, convey meaning with letters. Um, and so I hope that um, what you might take away from this is, um, you know, looking at your neighborhood with fresh eyes. Right, yeah, I mean, because the kind of uh, collective experience of maybe kind of, uh, the, the collective and intense experience isn't available, these kind of smaller and more personal details start maybe standing out in higher relief. Uh, so. I think that those are, are wonderful places to start um, when you're thinking about, um, yeah, well, wonderful places to start. I'll just think, leave it there. Um, okay, so if there are no more questions, I, I also wanna be very conscientious, conscientious of time, um, but I thought I could do just like the briefest of, um, intros into what you'll see when you open up one of these template files. Um, so um, if you would like to see that demonstrated, um, please, you're welcome to stick around and I will not be offended if you go. Um, so oh, cool. And of course, if you're familiar with InDesign, um, you know, no need to stick around. Um, okay. So um, I will share my screen one more time. All right, so let's see. So when you download, um, hopefully you're seeing my InDesign screen, just holler if, if you can't see it. Yes. Um, awesome, thank you. <laughs> when you download one of these files and you know double click to open it up in InDesign, um, it will open up as an untitled file. So the first thing you should do is um, you know, save a version to your desktop. Um, uh, so that it doesn't get lost and you don't lose any work. Um, and in the files that I've created for this workshop, um, there are two layers, um, one with the instructions and one with the actual template. And so it should look pretty much like this when you open it, except you won't have the ABCs in there. Um, and the instructions, um, you know, simply state the steps to follow. So um, select the image frame and then um, go to file and place or command D. Um, and it will pop up a window for you to select an image. So if I go into um, my selects from a recent walk, I can click this one and it places the image in, you know, at full scale. So I'm going to have to do a little bit of uh, repositioning and scaling to get it to work. Um, and uh, there's a few different ways that you could do that, but I'll just um, use this uh, scale tool in the top menu bar. And I'm just going to go to 50% to see if that brings it um in more clearly and it looks like i can start to see the outlines of an s so i'm just going to keep scaling it down another way to do this is um, to use the scale tool um, which is on the sidebar here 
and I can drop down an anchor point just by clicking and then scaling it down just like this. And so, you know, if you're starting with an image um, that only has the letter in it, um, you'll have a much easier time, I think, um, because you could use a tool um, pretty quickly, just going to object fitting fit content proportionally. So object fitting fit content proportionally, and then it scales the image down proportionally inside the box. So there's a few different ways that you could get there. Um, and as I was mentioning before, there are 32 little tiny boxes um, that, you know, will take a little while to fill in, um, but they're all there for you. And then there's a couple of um, backsides here. Um, so you could input your own caption if you wish. Um, and I'll just jump over into the other template. Um, this one is the survey template. Um, so with the survey prompt, that's the one where you would pick a category and try to make a collection of those signs as a category. Um, and so there's three image boxes here, six here, and then 12 here. Oops, I should update this to say 12, but there you have it. Um, and likewise, um, if you don't want to do too much finagling, you can just use the image boxes that are um, uh, provided here for you. And when you're finished with laying out your file, you can simply delete any page you don't want to use. So in the pages palette, um, if I decide I'm going to use the back without a caption, I would just delete the caption page. And since I'm going to have six images, I can delete the three and delete the 12. And um, since you have saved this version, you won't be editing the template file. It will just be, uh, you know, whatever you have decided to save your file as. So I'll leave it there, but I wanted to give you a little bit of a preview of what the templates would look like. Um, and um, there are a number of really great tutorials um, for InDesign. Um, if you run into any trouble when you're on your own working on your postcards. Um, okay, so I have um, been a little bit abusive of your time by going over significantly. So um, I'd like to wrap it up in the next couple of minutes, but I did wanna give you another opportunity to ask questions if anything's come up. These are, are wonderful, Diane. Thank you for, for the templates. I just wanted to mention that for the, the postcard contest, there are um, templates that are available in PDF uh, and form. And I think also uh, we have a Photoshop. Is that true? What do I have in here? Yeah, two Photoshop files for a front and back. And that the, the reason that we're using those templates is because the gallery, the Thompson Gallery uses a, a printer and has like a, a bulk mail ID. So like th there's like stipulations about, you know, how to mail these things. So you can always use uh, Diane's template and then export um, and uh, from InDesign and import into the templates for the, the design yeah. content. It would Thank be a you. little bit of an extra step, but I think that's yeah. a great um, strategy to make sure they align with the um, with the contest ones. These are four by six. I think, I think they might be similar. I'll double check. I think, yeah, I think I have like an eighth inch bleed um, on the, te the, the templates, but what I'll probably do, if you don't mind, is just add you, um, like combine the two and have like a separate little uh, category in the folder that I just linked. Oh, sure. So that, yeah. 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 So That'd be great. Awesome. This was so wonderful, Diane. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day and um, during a very intense week. <laughs> so these workshops this week is, have been wonderful just to kind of, you know, take some 
my mind off of other things. So they've just been truly, truly wonderful. Thank you. You're so welcome. And thank you so much to everybody for coming and for spending your even, evening with me. And I hope that if nothing else, you had a distraction from what else is going on in the world right now. So, um, All okay. Right. Bye, Diane. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Good Bye. night. Have a good day.